Welcome to Arts with Nations, the podcast that is for non-artists, artists, and everyone in between. We talk about art and try to explain what we think about it and as artists why we think that way. We ask questions to try and bridge the gap between viewer and creator to make the art world more accessible to everyone. Hello everybody, Andrew Malczewski here and welcome back to another wonderful episode of Arts with Nations. With me as always is... Joanna Bolsons. And today, we are going to talk a little bit about logos, icons, graphics, uh, a little bit of design. Instead of getting into like the nitty gritty of logo design, or logo culture, or graphic design, with an intense look at the history of those things, we're going to kind of take a general overview and talk more about the way that those things affect how we see stuff and how we view things in a contemporaneous kind of way. Yeah, like, so we're the digital age, and we look at logos all the time on our phone. We just, you probably just don't think about it. Like, the Instagram logo is the app face. And so, like, even if you're not seeing it on your phone, if you were to see a sticker of that logo, let's say on, like, a subway rail or something like that, you would instantly know that's Instagram. And so we wanted to talk about, like, how that shapes the way we see everything, how it's changed the way we view things like art and just the world in general yeah because this is something that in our own lifetime has skyrocketed to the forefront of visual culture just because of apps and the internet and the way that we now communicate with cell phones and smartphones you know in 1990 you would have you'd see logos and you would see stuff but they would be on a business card on a letterhead they would be on a sign to a school you wouldn't have 500 would, of them in your pocket. Yeah, it would be on the business itself, most likely. Or like you said, a business card. You wouldn't just... It wasn't as synonymous as it is now with... I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> but yeah, when it's not as synonymous as it is with you know, the identity of a company or a product. And even... Yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> and it's not just that... In the 90s, you would see that and you would recognize it as a corporate thing. It would be a corporate identity. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see it on your local liquor store or your local grocery. Or even your local artisan. Like, the best one probably that's universally known is the Golden Arches. Everybody knows McDonald's. You see that Golden M, you know what that is. But it's a corporation, like you yeah. said. Or the Pepsi, the circle with the two, the wave and yeah. the red and blue. Exactly. And But now you have local artisans trying to emulate that because you, you have to sell yourself as a brand now, especially online. Um, if you have your Etsy store, you have your own website, whatever, you want something that people can instantly recognize as you so that they'll buy your work. Yeah, and it's, I think it's one of the, the biggest problems us as artists are currently dealing with is the fact that everything has become a storefront. Mm-hmm. Instagram is now a storefront. Yeah. You know, Facebook is basically, it's a digital storefront mm-hmm. with some other things. TikTok you, is starting to as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you're not linking your store or your other social medias, you're selling yourself on there. It's no longer just about the work you're creating, but let me upload five videos of me creating this piece so that Mm -hmm. people are constantly seeing me and my work and my brand. Yeah, same thing with YouTube. Oh, look, here's all of our links that you can, like, what do you call them? It links to an Amazon page where they'll get a kickback from it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this, everything digital now, like, a platform comes out and within an incredibly short amount of time is becoming commoditized and monetized, yeah. yeah. And that means that logos and brand identity is becoming more and more important to the small business, the single person who is just trying to, you know, maybe as a side hustle Mm -hmm. or something that they do because they enjoy it and it's a way to offset their costs. They still have to be conscious and aware of these things. And that is something that 20 years ago was completely and totally not true. Yeah. And it it sounds like I'd like to stop right now because it sounds kind of like we're talking down about it or like complaining about it. That's not the case. It just is what it is. Yeah. It's Um, a product of late stage capitalism. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie. I could spend four hours on TikTok. I love watching progress videos. I love watching cake decorating videos. They are so soothing to me. 
but there are good and bad to it. And so we just wanted to bring that to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I think with that, a good place where we can kind of start is with a little history of logo design and where logos kind of come from, where this idea of an icon comes from. If you want to stretch it, you could say the earliest form of logos might be hieroglyphs using pictographic images as a type of language that we do communicate. Um, I think that's stretching it. Yeah, personally. I was about to say, I think that's a little too far. I mean, that's just language in general. If 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 I was a better linguist, I could say, well, technically the alphabet is a pictograph. Yeah, right. That's I, why I, I think what your a better version would be the um, graffitis we would see in like Pompeii or the Roman bathhouses. Even better, though, I would say would be cattle brands because Ooh. cattle brands have been used since the early Romans in like the 2700 BCs. That is a good one. And they're still used today by ranchers. And it is one of those, it is a identifying trademarked logo. Today it's a trademarked logo, but back then it was something that would let you distinguish your animal from someone else's. It yeah. was a unique identifier, something that everybody knew. Oh, the backwards RR, that's <laughs> Ronald Reagan's cow. And, oh no, the forward facing RR, that's Richie Real Times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is, but it was a way to identify those things, and that's what a good icon or logo does. It's something that you see, and it tells you all the information you need to know about that product. Who's it by? Who owns it? What kind of thing is it? And so I think cattle brands would probably be where I would go for the first the first thing that I can think of where we would say, yeah, that is an icon or a logo. Just sticking with the whole ranch theme, also barbed wire. From what I understand, there are different types of barbed wire, and certain ones are are owned by certain people. So, like, what? yeah, there are different types of the braids of wire for barbed wire. Mm, I think that gets too far away from the two dimensionality of what a logo is. Like that. I'm just imagery. saying that you can you can take an object, and if you manipulate it a specific way you can then make that synonymous with your identity your business right and the same thing is done in um, kilts or the traditional blanket and uh, woven pattern designs of indigenous peoples all around the world Ooh, that's a good one yeah i like okay i like us trying to tie the history in so that it's more than just the very cold, very flat business logos. Right, but that's where this idea of like iconography and cultural identifiers, us as fine artists, that's what we look for when yeah. we're talking about good logo design. You know, when I see something like McDonald's, part of that cultural identifier is the soulless corporate backing <laughs> and the cheapest food item you can find. Well, Starbucks is a favorite for me. I know it's kind of become a symbol of a lot of a lot of bad stuff in the last five years, if not ten. But I love their logo, and it's it's changed over time. Mm -hmm. They've covered up the mermaid a little bit so that you can't see how graphic it was. But the original logo, I loved. Mm -hmm. It was very feminist. It was very much like. I don't. I just really enjoyed that. I don't know how that ties into coffee and how they would tie that history of the mermaid to drinking caffeine, but I loved it. Well, it was Seattle based, so it was a bay kind of thing. Mermaids from the Pacific, right? But are you like calling in the men coming off of the fishing wharves to drink coffee? Well, that's one of the things with logo design is it doesn't have to actually hearken to a specific set of what your business is. It just has to be something that can then be associated. It's like... I think it should. I think a good logo design, or the best logo designs, I should say. A good logo design could be like the Starbucks where it doesn't necessarily tie into anything, but it just looks really nice. But like Apple, for instance, their name is Apple. So they chose an Apple. Right, but when they name the company Apple, the naming convention has nothing to do with computers. I thought it was because it was spreading knowledge. We we're trying to further our 
horizon and learning or whatever. Oh, and really? so they chose an apple because it was from the tree of knowledge. Really? I didn't know that. I could be completely reading into that. Huh. That's interesting, though. Is that's that, yeah. how I've always taken it. Hmm. I can't say that I've read that anywhere, but that's just how I've always taken it. Because computers were a huge leap forward for us. Yeah, I don't. The thing is, like now we see them as these tools that are spreading knowledge and doing all this stuff. When they first started off, though, I don't know if that was. I don't know. Like I just, I, I don't. That's know that how much I've always the... taken it. But now we have them in our back pocket, and it's to, <laughs> <laughs> it's to uh, just mindlessly zone out for several hours. I don't think so. <laughs> I think well, that, that's how I use mine. <laughs> I use mine. It was the other day I looked up whether you could grow a vanilla plant indoors. So I'm like, could I grow out my own vanilla beans? I had no clue. And I was like, man, 20 years ago, I would have had to go to a library and see if I could find a horticultural book on whether this was possible. And then try to find another book, see if it was possible in my region. That's now, true. I was kind of like putting myself down. But I do have those plant apps where I'm like, I can't figure out what's wrong with my plant. I just take a picture and it diagnoses it. But to get back to logos. Wait, wait, wait. Can we grow vanilla in our own home? Yeah. That's exciting. Okay, continue. So getting <laughs> getting back to logos. So um, things like Apple and this idea that an icon or logo doesn't have to be associated with anything. It can just be free from them. <laughs> If you look at the history of logos and history of icons, the earliest logo is actually from uh, Stella Artois, the brewer. Oh. Uh, so it was in 1366 that Stellar Artois first developed their logo. And this is widely considered to be the first corporate logo ever produced, but it wasn't until uh, 1777 that the Bass Brewing Company trademarked the first official logo put in the UK. And that's widely considered to be the first trademarked logo. Hmm. And Bass's was just a red triangle with a cursive script of Bass in the bottom. And it's still seen on their beer box. And this is before screen printing, before, you know. And they had woodcuts. They had woodcuts, but this is before, like, mass marketing and that kind of, those kind of systems. And it was probably because they recognized that the uh, aristocrats from the previous generation, they all had their own coat of arms, mm. which would identify the family. Yeah. And in the same way that you can see a coat of arms, you know, oh, it's that family. I know who they are. I know to like where they rank, yeah. society. Whether to it. run or <laughs> right, you could do the same thing. And in the history of logos, I would say if you look at them, you have these cattle brands. You have some other things that kind of come along that are similar. But I think the next big step would be things like coats of arms and maker marks. Once you started to have an aristocratic class, they then wanted a quality item. And so you start to get maker marks like in England, your silver stamp is still a government regulated stamp that has to go on all British silver. So like this sword, you were talking about whenever they would do a, make a sword, they would do their silver stamp in that. They would make a, a silver pitcher. I, th I think we're going to too niche and so i just want to clarify what you're talking about yeah but those kind of things like a, a blacksmith would put his mark on the, the work that he made or a potter would put a stamp okay on okay. the bottom of the pottery and even in china you would see pottery studios using a single stamp or set yeah. of stamps to identify that studio which we use, we still use that today we, yeah i mean i have a mark that i put on all of my work if i want to sign it yeah not actually put a signature and so if you think of those things as kind of the precursor to the icon of the logo, and there is a difference between a logo and an icon. One is just a, the icon is a small recognizable image, and a logo can be a, is often an image or a group of words or text that def, are generally a defining mark of a person or corporation. So, uh, so we're like PeopleSoft. Their logo might be PeopleSoft, but the icon might just be like a PS or like Photoshop. Yeah, it might be PS, but right. But their actual logo is different. 
those have started to become more conflated as with the app culture we're in. People are like, no, my logo and my icons, they should be the same thing because you're going to see it every day. Yeah. Or at least the same color scheme. Yes, and that's more of a brand identity where you take, like, all Photoshop is that blue. And so you'll see in all printed documentations, online documentations, that seem blue for everything that's Photoshop, whereas Illustrator's orange. So when you think Illustrator that's written about it or yeah. promoted uses that orange. But those are some of the idiosyncrasies of corporate identity and product design that someone who's a graphic designer would be conscious and aware of as they're looking at these things and as they're designing them, they're thinking, how do I do this? How do I make these things? An interesting factoid uh, that I can just throw out here in this history of logos is that in 1961, Tom Gessmer designed the first abstract logo for a corporate identity. It was from Chase Bank. There's a really good 99% Invisible, which is a great podcast by Roman Mars. Check it out. The episode's about 10 minutes long, and they're incredibly informative and well-researched on our podcast. Yeah, we're, we're not that kind. We are not that podcast. <laughs> but 99% Invisible is, and one of the episodes is on how powerful and how much of a risk Citibank using just this abstract mark to represent them was. Because before then, they were Citibank, and the logo was like C I T I. T ran across the top. And the problem was you, to get it on paper and on business cards, it took up a lot of space. And so redesigns to be just like this square with these inside of like a little uh, octagon. Really simple, really abstract, but immediately recognizable. And it could fit on everything. You could put it on a pin. And that was his that was one of the reasons he was able to get approval from like, the top of the CEO was that can make a pin you can wear on your blazer mm -hmm. that just had the logo and everybody would be able to see it at a good distance and still know city bank well and when you think about it too like say they had a skyscraper you're, you're not gonna want to put city bank across the side skyscraper it's gonna to me it's gonna make the skyline look terrible whereas if you have this nice logo it's it's still a little I hear what you're saying, but now I'm instantly thinking of all the buildings that have gaudy words. I would just rather see gaudy logos that might have an interesting design than gaudy text. And, like, from a distance, you can still make out the logo and understand what it is, whereas maybe from a distance you can't read it, clearly. Especially if it has, like, a specific color, like Frost Bank. They have that big skyscraper downtown. I know the Frost building because of the design of the building and because of the design of the logo. Yeah. I wonder when... I wonder if Citibank was the push to move away from that kind of large text on the buildings. Because I still... I mean, I'm having a hard time with thinking of like large cities that don't have text on the buildings. I can't remember if that's actual real life I think or the video only one, games and movies I've seen. I think the only one that I can think of that still does text is Bank of America. Yeah. Oh, other things like USAA, but those are abbreviations. Yeah. I think you see a lot more abbreviations. And even, names. even their name is kind of designed, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? Like designed out enough to where it's almost abstract yeah. text. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a unique typography. Yeah. They're just using Comic Sans and sticking it up there. I think another interesting to think interesting thing to think about too is whenever you're thinking about logo and branding, like Disney. So their text is very specific to Disney's handwriting. Mm -hmm. It's very curved because children respond to curves more um, positively than harsh lines. Mm -hmm. That's why clown makeup, it's all very curvy and circular, no sharp points or anything. Um, just a little history on clowns for you. Um, but Disney text, that's copyrighted. You yes. can buy specific stamps in their typography. And I think that's interesting, too. Like, you can build up such a brand, such a corporation, to where even the way you write text is synonymous with you 
Like, I can see somebody make a card. They might have used Disney stamps to stamp out, like, happy birthday or whatever. They might not have anything Disney on the card itself, but as soon as I see that text, I know that's Disney. Right. And that's, I mean, that's the power of the AI. Logo is it good design overall. Good design overall, yeah. Is that it invokes the, you know, it, it hits you so that you remember and it invokes emotion and feeling when you see those things. You relate it to something. You have that association with it that you can say like, oh, whether good or bad, I recognize this for this company. Like same thing with McDonald's. Yeah, I mean, now I'm like corporate, whatever. When I was a kid, going to McDonald's was a treat. And I, have, I have good memories of going to McDonald's and getting Happy Meals and being super pumped up and prize. Yeah. Because it was like, my parents knew that McDonald's was garbage and <laughs> we shouldn't eat McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. And so when we went, me as the stupid kid thought, this is amazing. I get fast food. Yay. Yeah. And now I'm like, I would rather eat pretty much anywhere other than McDonald's unless I am in a serious rush on a road trip and it's the only thing for breakfast. And even then I get maybe a hash brown. <laughs> yeah. Like, I can't handle that food. <laughs> yeah. If you call it that. <laughs> but McDonald's offense, they are some of the cheapest food that you can get. And you can get a lot of free food from McDonald's too through their apps and through different promotions. I mean you can do that anywhere. You can get it at Whataburger for you through their apps and stuff. Yeah. And it's good for, it does help some people you know, who are traveling. It's good travel. There's, I've been watching blogs of people walking across America and using McDonald's a lot because it is everywhere. They have their free Wi-Fi. Free too. Wi-Fi. And so you can go in there and you can get like just a quick hot meal, charge all your stuff up, and then go on your phone and watch your podcast. Well, we're getting off topic there. Yes. But I, speaking of fast food, though, as a Texan native... Whataburger's huge here, right? It was started here. It's like the our, Texan McDonald's. Yeah, it's the Texan McDonald's. It's our go-to fast food. Their design is great because not only do they incorporate their logo, but the building itself. They use the A-frame design mm-hmm. so that miles down the road, or I guess not miles, but pretty far down the road where you just see in the horizon, you see an A-frame great there's a Whataburger we can yeah. stop and get something hot quick cheap get back on the road yeah so that's a little bit of the history and some <laughs> tangents on the history of logo and icon design one of the reasons why we wanted to have this conversation is because of the way that you know things have changed over the past 20 years what really brought us to light was I was watching a stream by Friends at the Table another podcast or an actual play tabletop rpg podcast man you're just trying to get friends all over all the friends yes (laughs) any of those people ever hear this and love to contact me please do please please Please. i'm tired of him trying to drag me into his D &D lifestyle (laughs) anyways they were having a stream and they were talking about stationery and they're on they're showing pictures of these stationery books that they were looking at and one of the the cast members mentioned that it was a beautiful picture of the stationery, but because of Instagram, it was almost useless as someone who was looking to buy a product because it was laid out in a way that was great for Instagram. It was beautiful. It showed all these nice things and it had all these nice little peripherals and things on it, but it didn't actually show the product, how the product worked, what the, the features of the product was. Yeah. And I was like, huh, it's that is so true how that kind of culture of how we view things because of things like Instagram, because of things like TikTok, has changed the way that designers have now gone about thinking about how they present products to us. Because mm-hmm. it's no longer, here's the function of my piece. It's, you know, I, I made it this beautiful color. I have these great design qualities. It's functional. And as somebody who loves using a physical planner and not the calendar on my phone, I really appreciate that. But whenever they present it with all these extra things sprinkled around it, like, oh, here's this nice pen. I have flowers in the background. Like, let me just see the calendar itself. What does your month look like? Okay. Now, how did you do the days of the week? 
Because normally yeah. you do your month, you flip a page, then they've got the days laid out. Like, how did you do that? Do they, are there lines? It's just a big blank square. But they don't do that. They have this artsy photograph with great lighting. And it's just, it's not telling me what I need to know if I want to use this product and enjoy it. Right. But you know that we'll post great on your feed. Oh, yeah. You it'll make your... Form. It'll make your Instagram page look great. Yeah. What do they call it? Your feed? Where, like, as you scroll through somebody's profile, it's all, it flows, and it's all the same color spectrum. Yeah, there's something to that. I, and it's just, and it, I get it if you're a designer, if you're selling your work, like, you want to build a style so that it's synonymous with you, but it really, it really kind of freaks me out when it's people just selling themselves in a way selling their life in a way and i'm like okay so you did this dark hazy filter on all of your stuff you're living at the beach man they should be bright and colorful (laughs) like don't be dark and artsy yeah (laughs) i thought you were having a good day drinking coffee on the beach coffee on the beach and segue back into icons (laughs) and logos Um, but that that idea of how things have changed lately made me think about that idea of the Citibank logo and how it's changed. And if you think about icons and logos, like you mentioned earlier, the Instagram logo. It's changed. It's changed. Over time. It's yeah. changed over time. And that's the product of good design is that as things change and people change, then your icon and your logo will shift to reflect those changes. Instagram is an excellent example of a logo that changed well. I can't think of any of that changed poorly because... Facebook. They now have that infinity symbol because they changed their name infinity. too. They're now Meta. They're all in on the Metaverse. <laughs> Which we could do a whole episode on why I think that's a bad idea. Watch all of our stuff just gets deplatformed. <laughs> all of our stuff gets deleted. Yeah, right. We don't know everything. what happened. We do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. You're the parent company for all the places we post. <laughs> but it does have an effect on our social structures and how we as a culture react to these things and so when you see things like artists who brand themselves and we were talking about this on facebook and tiktok well you're you're an artist we're both artists i mean i kind of feel that i shouldn't have to have a part-time job branding myself right just so that I can show my work and get it out there so people can see it. That's exactly how I feel. If anything, just to make myself feel better. Like, would I make more sales? Maybe. Would I get maybe picked up and monetized? Maybe. But I don't want to do that. It's draining emotionally to constantly have to take pictures in an artsy way, make sure I add the filter, let me put my makeup on real quick before I do a video. Like, no. I'm going to do it to where I feel comfortable and where I can make the best work. It's right. not me. It's my work. And I don't want to do all this extra stuff just to satisfy some streaming service. Right. And that kind of brings up another point, which is how much, I mean, how often does a slick logo and a good presentation hide average work or even below average? Right. And there is something to be said for just, you know, I, I fall into this trap all the time when I'm looking for, you know, handyman or services. You know, if I call someone and you don't have a web page, I'm looking for a restaurant to go to, and I'm like, let me go to your web, you don't have a web page? I have to go to a Facebook page? I don't want to go to Facebook, I want to go to a website. I don't want to have to log in to Facebook because I don't like Facebook. I don't, I don't mind that, especially if it's a restaurant. Like, I get it. You're selling food. Why do you need a website? It makes it easier, yes, but if it's a small mom and pop shop, I'm not going to expect them to have a website. I think the best food are, are at those small mom and pop shops, but I can understand if they, especially if they're brand new, you don't have your website yet. Yeah. And I wouldn't expect you to. Like, the last time I touched my website probably like three months ago yeah and that's being very generous like yeah i I, I think we expect too much of the small creators 
the small businesses because everything is so easily accessible now. We expect small businesses to put the same amount of effort into the social media extras that we do these giant corporations that have teams to specifically for right. that. And I think that's, and it's frankly BS that we expect small artists, small businesses, and just people that want to put out work that they enjoy, maybe not even as a, as a side hustle for us to expect that of them. I think it's BS. Yeah. And part of that is from that Instagram, you know, social media culture yeah. that has developed. I do. I think it's, that's why I said, you know, all these things that are becoming just marketplaces. You know, it's oversaturating everything where everything just has to be a product that you're selling. I feel like if I just put a picture of work that I'm making because I'm happy with it, it's like, what's why even bother? Nobody's looking at it to look at good art. They're looking at it to either get something out of it or because they want to, oh, can I buy that? I can't buy that. Well, why post it? Yeah. You know, like, nobody's just... Using these services just that's obviously not true. I when I do look at Instagram, I am just looking for I just want to look at cool stuff. But the problem is as I'm flipping through these sites, 80, 70, 80 percent of them are, oh, check me out. I'm doing this thing, check me out on this place, find my DM me for yeah. this. Or if I post something on Twitter, anytime I post anything on Twitter or Instagram that's podcast related, I get DM this to this person, get 10,000 yeah. more th- I don't want you to advertise to me. I just want to put this out there mm-hmm. so people can find it. Same on Instagram. Every time I post on there, DM to this, DM to this. You're a bot, dude. Just go away. Yeah. Like, I'm just trying to put my work out there and hopefully somebody enjoys it. Because you're right. I scroll through Instagram. I scroll through TikTok. I love watching those videos of people making things. There's a girl that made, like, a dress out of pennies. That's so fun. One girl figured out how to make her own chain mail. I love watching those progress videos. And hopefully, by me enjoying them, I'm not putting that same pressure that I sometimes feel on myself to make those videos. But it's exactly what you said earlier. It's late-stage capitalism. Where it's like, I don't have any downtime. I better turn this into a side hustle. Right. And I think that's another kind of unfortunate product of where we're at is that everything should be turned into a side hustle. Oh, you like playing video games? You should be streaming on Twitch. Oh, you like to make artwork? You should be posting on Instagram, TikTok. You should be monetizing this. Selling it on Facebook. Or like, oh, you bought those clothes on Amazon? You should link that to your Amazon account so that, like... I don't know how they do it because I don't care, but whenever I will go to like double tap a friend's photo on Instagram, those little dots will pop up where you can buy this top here, you can buy this short here. What? Because they're buying it through like Amazon or some other online entity, and so they link it to their picture so they can get discounts, or maybe you can get discounts if you buy it through their link. It's like, that is so exhausting. All I wanted to do was like your picture because it's a cute outfit. Yeah. And now I'm being bombarded with even more ads from my friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which we've got way too off. We've got off the deep end. <laughs> but not really, because all of that ties into this idea of iconography. I know, but we and went off the dark, is, deep end, yeah. and I, I didn't. I wanted to stay away from that because I wanted to try to enjoy my weekend. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's one of the things that icons and labels do is all that experience is tied back into the icon. When you see it, all that stuff comes to the forefront, and it's why you know, if a company damages themselves like if Facebook ever comes back from this meta thing I don't think they'll ever go away but they'll definitely get ridiculed uh, I think I think that if they ever get an antitrust suit brought against them that breaks them up meta will be the first thing that will go away because it's it's losing money hand over fist and it's only being kept afloat because it's part of a larger I feel like everything would go away at that point because don't they own Instagram? But Instagram is its own self-contained entity that could still survive outside of being like Facebook isn't feeding money into Instagram to keep it afloat. It is feeding billions of dollars into Meta, the Metaverse. <laughs> this is too much. I don't care. Yeah. Anyways, but that's like this idea of the icon and logo and how 
these things affect the culture. Yeah, and positive and negatively, positively or negatively, they do in influence us. Pun on influencer, I guess. Yeah. But as artists, I do enjoy looking at logos and seeing how they change over time, like the Starbucks one or Coca Cola. Um, and it's also the joy of being in a large metropolis or urban center is walking through and seeing all the, the bright shining lights and all the ads and all the yeah. you know these well crafted well designed things like you know if you think about Times Square in New York the iconic giant billboards with like wicked and the glitz and the glamour yeah. it's all advertisement yeah. but it's iconic to that location and it is a culturally significant part of what we see when we experience these places. Well, even going out to eat, I like looking at the menus. I like to see how they laid it out. I like to see how they did their logo for their store. Um, small clothing boutiques. Like, there was... What was the one we saw the other day? We couldn't figure out if it was um, a ranch or a resale shop. Oh, yeah. It was like... Uh, it was a small building... And it just had like a single word. It was like, no, it was two words. Yeah. But then on like a banner, they had boutique underneath it. But the building itself was painted like a cow, so it was very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> but like confusing in an enjoyable way, so that we were trying to figure it out as we were at the stoplight. So just as an artist, seeing logos like that and design like that, it's fun and it's a puzzle. It's intri- it's intriguing. Yeah, and seeing a clever. A really clever, well thought out design is enjoyable. Yeah. Like, there's, you can Google this online, but like um, clever logo designs or logos that are endemic of the product they're made for. So things like it's like a duck core, but the, it's just a D that looks like a mom's head. Have you seen the? It's a restaurant. It's like Mallard Duck or something like that. And it's a Mallard and a duck hugging so that their necks wrap around each other but they make the md for Uh, mallard duck i think i have that one is so good yeah so good and there are other ones and that kind of design where you look at it and you're just like okay i understand what it is i get the product and the company and also it's smart yeah It, it like you can tell Somebody was having a good day when they designed that. Like, <laughs> as soon as they had done doing that, they were like, that's it. I'm going to do seven more, but I know that's the one. Yeah. Because it just, it sings. And there's something about hitting that and seeing that experience that that is very pleasurable and very much makes me want to learn more about what it is. Well, also, as a wine enthusiast, I go after the pretty bottles. I do stick with the, with the rosés. I like the sweet pink stuff. But like... If it has an Art Nouveau label, I'm getting it. It's a personal preference for me. That's one of my favorite designs. That's my one of my favorite eras in art history. So yeah, you put an Art Nouveau mermaid, girl in the woods, <laughs> fairy, I'm going to get it. Hmm. Yeah. Or Which like, is... we love that um, one cherry blossom it's wine. It's good. We do not know the name of that. <laughs> No the clue. people that make that, but we know it has a cherry blossom it's on their label. Trilli- yeah, cherry blossoms on it. So really we, we grab like three. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we finally ended on a good note. We went dark for a little bit. No, I don't think we went dark. For Saturday morning. This is a kids TV. I was trying to think of what the old Fox Cartoon Network kids programming block was called. Oh, I don't know. Or any, whatever, any of the kids programming, they all had fun kid names. I know the ABC had Disney's One Saturday Morning. Yes. They had that little song. Well, this is... (laughs) But this has been our talk about design and logo? Yeah, I think I said icon and logos enough in this episode that we can call it an icon and logo <laughs> The episode. iconic logo. Yeah, the iconic logo episode that's not <laughs> about icons or logos. But it's, it's All right, I am Andrew Malczewski. I am Joanna Bolson. And hopefully you're still you. 
Thank you for listening to our podcast. It means so much that you would take the time to listen to us. If you like what you hear and would like to help us out, please like, comment, and subscribe. We want to have a conversation, and sometimes that means that as we talk about things, we might make mistakes, like in the pronunciation of names or the misattribution of statements or a piece of work, and messing up titles and dates. If we do and we notice, we'll put a correction in the show notes, and if we don't, please let us know so we can. We invite you to join the conversation, so please get in contact. Email us your favorite artwork, ask us to explore a specific artist, or ask how something is made. You can find us at www.artsplanations.com. There you can also find out more about us, the show, and each episode. You'll be able to find out every artist, quote, and most of the specific vocabulary we use in each episode, as well as a list of upcoming topics. If you are curious about our artwork, the best place to find us is on our Instagram and other social medias, which are linked through the Artsplanation website. We would also like to thank the Joy Jobs, the free music archive for our music. 